Okay. Sure. Okay. So today we are going to talk about two things. One is randomized control trials and uh, community trials. You can ask me any questions when I am taking the class. So the next <clears throat> one, one and a half hours, we are going to talk about randomized control trials. Main strength and weakness. What are different types of RCTs? How do you analyze the results of an RCT? How to conduct them? And more importantly, when you finish the RCT, how do you report a RCT? And at the end of the session, we are also going to talk a few minutes about the community trials. What is the difference types of community trials also? So when you talk about the randomized control trial, before going into the randomized control trial, we should know about the what are the different types of study designs. Okay, so the basic difference between the randomized control trial and observation study is the investigator assigns the exposure. Then it becomes an experimental study. If the investigator does not assign the exposure, it will become an observational study. If there is a comparison group, then it will become an analytical study. If there is a no comparative group, it is a descriptive study. If you are doing analysis in an observation study, if we go from exposure to outcome, it becomes a case cohort study. If you go from outcome to the exposure, it becomes a case control. If you do exposure and outcome at the same time, it's a cross-sectional study. Today we are going to talk about randomized control trial. So randomized control trials comes under the, in the hierarchy of epidemiological study design, it comes very high. So compared to your case series, cohort studies, case control, randomized control trial comes on top of that. On top of randomized control trial is when you do a meta-analysis where you pull the data of individual randomized control trial, it becomes a meta-analysis. So basically case series, case reports, control, they generate hypothesis, but to establish a causality, we need only a randomized control trial. So what is a randomized control trial? is an epidemiological experiment in which subjects in a population are randomly allocated to groups, usually called study group, the another group is a control group, to receive or not to receive an experimental or a therapeutic procedure or a manual or any intervention. So that is called a randomized control trial. In this randomized control trial, randomization is the only unique feature of a randomized control trial. So, what you do is you have a set of protocols. So it starts at a defined point unique for each individual. Sequential enrollment of patients. We keep on enrolling the patients as they come. And observation begins upon the enrollment of study. And we have a fixed set trial closure also is there in a randomized control trial. So in the randomized control trial, we have two groups. One is a control group. And another one is the intervention group. Control group should be reasonably same as the treated subject to ensure the compatibility. And also we should understand the concept of standard of care and the placebo. Some trial will give a randomized, a randomized control trial. Some, tri some trials induce placebo control. That means placebo will get an inert substance, which is called a placebo. And another group will get an intervention drug or treatment, whatever you call for the intervention. So what is called standard of care? Suppose if you want to do a trial in rheumatology, especially in rheumatoid arthritis, we cannot do a trial without methotrexate. Both the control group and the treatment group should control, should have the same methotrexate. So methotrexate is called standard of care. If you don't have a standard of care for a particular disease, then we can use a placebo control. If you have a standard of care, they should have standard of care in both the arms, placebo and the control arm, then the new treatment is the add-on treatment. So that is called standard of care. So when you talk about the randomized control trial, there are phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four trials in the various clinical, all the clinical trials, most of the clinical trials are randomized control trials. So when you have a randomized control trial, so we have phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, so before going to phase one, we have preclinical or animal studies. So that somebody calls as phase zero. Phase one 
it's remember that it is happens in the normal human beings healthy normal healthy controls the volunteers so here they will give the drug and see how the drug is absorbed how the drug is distributed how the drug is metabolized by the body so here normal healthy volunteers there is no patients in phase 1 trial most of the time whatever you read in the journals are phase 2 and phase 3 trials so what is a phase 2 trial so phase 2 trial you can see here the patients will be the people with the disease will be in, included in this study this phase 2 trial is mainly used for dosing and safety dose of the child we want to give 10 mg per kg 20 mg per kg or then we also going to talk about the safety of the drug in the patients with the disease or the condition to be treated diagnose or prevented so basically we are going to do pharmacokinetic study and the dosing regimens in phase 3 trial here are the expanded clinical trials here we talk about the effectiveness of the specific intervention and also better safety and drug related adverse effects so here we talk about the effectiveness and the adverse effect of the drugs so that is in phase 3 clinical trials phase 4 so after the phase 3 is done the drug company will submit all the trial results to the fda food and drug administration us so they will go through the whole things pre clinical phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 studies and they give permission to this drug they will give license to market this drug in the community so once the drug comes into the market the patient the, the physicians will be using this drug and the company has to do something called post marketing surveillance that is your phase 4 so after the drug has come into market they have to see how much any new side effect is coming so this is basically performed to determine the incidence of new adverse effects determine the long term safety because you remember that randomized controlled trial usually goes for one year two years after that what happens nobody knows to this patient so here they are going to talk about the long term follow up So, and marketing comparison about the other products and the other uses. So, all has to be done in phase four. This is called post-marketing surveillance. So, to put it in a nutshell, I told you preclinical. This is basically in the animal studies. Then the phase one safety in normal volunteers. Phase two dosing and safety in hundred to thousand patients. In phase three are really the huge numbers where you are talking about the safety and the efficacy. Then I said you FDA will approve to confirm the safety and effectiveness. and the drug is approved and it comes to the market what happens in the real life here the drug got approved and what happens in real life is the phase 4 or something called post marketing surveillance when we talk about the randomized controlled trial ethics comes into play because is we are going to intervene you are going to do some new intervention to new people or the patients and you are going to have some placebo so there are a lot of ethical issues comes when you do a randomized control trial can you use this drug can you cannot use this drug with the placebo without placebo there are various human subject protection guidelines has come starting from the belmont report international conference of harmonization good clinical practice declaration of kenlisky and nuremberg report this is for the various countries for india we have icmr schedule y which is the human subject protection guidelines especially for india so whenever you do a clinical trial or when you read a paper on a randomized controlled trial we have to answer this four questions so what this is called picco statement p stands for patient or the disease we are talking about population of the patients or the problem i stands for intervention or what's the treatment you are giving or a new test you are doing comparison who are you comparing with are you comparing with another therapy drug a versus drug b or drug a versus placebo placebo as i already told you is inert substance which is just looks like similar to the intervention and the outcome outcome could be the response to the treatment long term survival you can measure the outcome in a randomized control trial so in a randomized control trial we have something called primary outcome and the secondary outcome primary outcome is your central question otherwise we call them as hypothesis of your randomized control trial ideally one and it is well stated in advance before you start the study we should have a primary objective or the outcome so this is what you are going to do so what is the difference basically this is the basis for your design and the sample size calculation you are going to have something called sample size calculation on your randomized control trial to do a sample size calculation we should show one primary outcome 
So primary outcome may be I want to show that drug A works better than drug B in 20% or 30%. So you should have a primary idea. So based on that sample size is calculated. Secondary is related to the primary. It is also stated in advance and it is limited number but usually it is more than one. It can be three, four, five. But remember that our study is called positive study if the primary outcome is met. If the primary outcome is not met, it becomes a negative study. So this is what the randomized control trial goes by. So you get a population of interest, you take a sample population and you randomize. We will talk about randomization next. Then we do, we divide them into intervention group and control group. Then you do the assessment. Then you follow those both the groups and the control group and you do the assessment again. And we, is there a difference in that assessment T0 and the T1? So how do you take sampling? We have group, group num, lot of patients in the population. How are you going to take the sample? So there is something called convenience sampling. So convenience sample is usually generated by asking the patients who are easily accessible. That means all the patients coming to the clinic will be enrolled or you can say that I will see enroll all the patients coming on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So it's very inexpensive and quick, but remember that it is very prone to bias because these patients are already having problems who are coming to the hospital. Simple random is like a list of patients. Okay, I have in this community, this disease, I have 100 patients, I'm going to take 50. Simple randomization, I'll take number one, three, five, seven. But again, it is by highly representative, but it's very expensive. Stratified randomization, we can randomize the people according to their age, ethnicity, race, so that the study is powered to evaluate subgroups of interest. Suppose I want to use a drug in adults with more than 18 years for a hypertensive drug. If I have only all the patients who are below 40 years, then I will say this drug works below 40 years. I may not get any patients. What happens to patients after 40 years? So stratification can be done under the age, ethnicity, race and all. Cluster, I'll show you examples. We can cluster and randomize. Okay, I'm going to school two schools in Velu. I am going to randomize one school. I am going to do one intervention in one school compared to the another school. That is called cluster randomization. So why do you want to randomize? As I told you, to tends to produce a comparable groups. So at the end of the inclusion, we will have two groups where measured and unmeasured known and unknown prognosis factors and other characteristic for the participants at the time of randomization are completely balanced. What are the elements of the trial can be randomized? You can randomize an individual patient. You can randomize a cluster randomization. Like as I already told you, families, schools, towns, hospitals, communities. Only thing in the cluster randomization, we have something called worry about contamination. Suppose you take 100 people in a particular village and say that we are going to, you all have to follow a particular uh, diet. And at the end of the day, at the end of six months, we want to see that which group has got less obesity. But remember that when you do the cluster randomization, we don't have control. One person from that cluster will go and say the other group saying that I am following this diet that will reduce the weight. He may also follow the diet without you knowing that. So that is something called contamination. So this is the example I'm showing you for a cluster randomization. So here what they have done is they have, they have randomized 203 urban slums areas in the Lucknow. So 50 of them are chosen and 20 of the slums, they are going to give, this is for deworming, they are going to give the usual care and some group are going to get albendazole. So this is an open label cluster randomization study, the effects of deworming on a malnourished preschool children in India. So they, they are randomized into two groups, 25 slums gets usual care and another 25 slums gets albendazole plus usual care. How do you achieve this randomization? Randomization can be achieved by two methods. One is called generation of allocation sequence and how is the implementation of the allocation. So these two concepts you should understand. How can I generate an allocation? Suppose it's very simple. Simply if you want to do a randomization, you toss a coin. Okay, head comes, I'll give drug A. If the tail comes, I can give drug B. So that is the simplest form of doing randomization. So this is called simple randomization. Something called block randomization can be done, restricted and stratified randomization. So simple randomization, I told you what is called block randomization. If block randomization is done to ensure equal balance of arms throughout all portions of the study. Stratified, I have told you, we can get equal number of male, female, 
we can get equal number of age 10 to 20 years 20 to 30 years we can get so this is a simple randomization somebody had a fall and uh, there is two types of treatment one is a medical treatment one is a surgical treatment you put a dice okay if every time the dice comes one i will do surgical treatment if two comes i will do a muscle, medical treatment okay so but remember that here there is a problem is, is consider a simple trial of 12 patients there is an equal chance of being allocated to treat a or b but the number of patients are randomly assigned suppose if you toss a coin we may not know that out of 12 you will get six times i will get hit six times i'll get tail you may get five five times you can get hit seven times you may get tail but what happens you will not get equal number of patients in both the groups so block randomization is done to get equal number of patient in both the groups so for example for example suppose i want to do a study of 24 people so i want 12 in one group 12 in the another group so i'm going to use a block size of four and we need so six into four so we need 20, we need six blocks each block has size of four so what are the possible combinations of that four two a's and two b's we have only two groups because we have size of four each block is going to have two a's and two b's so each block can have a a b b so first patient will get a second to first block so i'll have first block first patient will be a second patient will be a third patient may be b fourth patient may be b In the block two a b a b third block a b b a so we can have multiple permutation combinations of different groups so that you cannot guess what who will be the next patient and each block suppose for example even if the study stops at this is 24 patients suppose you stop the study at 12 you will get equal number of a and equal number of b six a's will be there six b's so you will be stopping at third block because only 24 pa 12 patients have come then it's called a a b b a b a b and three blocks still you get six a's and six b's so this is the idea of block randomization so block randomization is done to get equal number of patients in each group one second thing is to allocation concealment also so that i cannot guess okay this patient has got a so next patient will get b the primary investigator cannot know which patient will get what group stratified randomization i told you already you can stratify according to the age of the patients this is a young girl middle aged woman old woman so how street goes so stratified randomization takes place correction suggested by blocking one step further how are you going to concealment of allocation so i already told you preventing foreknowledge about the next allocation so who will what will be the next allocation if i know the next patient is going to get the drug and the first drug is going to be the placebo i may say that okay this patient is sick so the primary investigator should not know what the next patient will get so we have to tell the patient we are going to do a randomized control trial i also don't know what you will get you may get placebo there's a 50 percent chance you may get a placebo 50 percent chance you may get the drug but after the end of the trial only even i will know so this is defeat the process of study and yield a bias if you know the allocation then it will defeat the purpose of randomization don't confuse the blinding of participants we are going to come to that later blinding we'll talk later so what are the advantages of a clinical trial okay so here the efficient for investigating the causality because the cause precedes the effect then here i can say the intervention caused the effect so that's what it says that investigating the causality because of this intervention you got the outcome then it's also confounding factors are balanced in both the groups because of the randomization the same confounding factors will be there in both the groups it gets nullified when you do the analysis and randomization has a simple statistical analysis we'll talk about that when we talk about how do you analyze a randomized controlled trial and it's practical way of minimizing several sources of bias especially selection bias because randomization occurs if the physician if the primary investigator also blinded so he will not he will also the selection bias definitely comes down what are the disadvantages subjects are often highly selected group that is the biggest disadvantage of a randomized control trial it is not the real life patients what do you mean by real life patients is usually if they are a very sick patient very complicated patient they will not enter that trial because they have strict exclusion criteria for any trial again remember that it is not suitable for rarer outcomes because i my trial runs only for six months one 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 year if the outcome does not happen 
during that time. You cannot say it will not happen. So it is not suitable for rare outcomes and also not suitable for outcomes recurring long, long and extensive follow-up. Suppose smoking causes lung cancer after five years. We cannot randomize, do a control, randomized control trial for five years. There is some adherence and withdrawal issues because even you are in a trial, if you, especially if you are in a placebo group, if you don't get better after three months, a trial is supposed to be for one year. Suppose the patient feels three months, there is no improvement at all. A patient may last to follow up or it may say that I don't want to continue this trial and it will go away. Limitations of external validity. What does it mean? Okay, this study is done in US. Their population is different and our population is different. Can you ex extrapolate the same results this by this from the study done in US to India is a question. Our group of population may be different. Our group of insurance company background is different. So we cannot really extrapolate that the same study which is done in US to India. And also remember that it is a very complex, expensive, especially drug trials. The new drug is going to come into the market yet unless the company sponsors the drug, it's very difficult to do a drug trial. Time consuming, I told you, because we have a randomized control trial, we have to follow them very closely. Each and everything has to be documented and then only we, so it's very time consuming and ethically questionable. Suppose we know that drug works, the new drug has come to the market or it's under the trial, under the research. And if we know that drug works, is it ethical to do a trial by giving a group called control group without that drug? That's why that question came. I told you about the standard of care. If you are giving standard of care, that is ethically acceptable. Even though they know that drug works, that's the only way to do the trial. But the baseline drug, baseline or the standard of care has to be given for everybody who has this, who are going to conduct the study. Next one. Types of clinical trials. Based on the interventions, how do how do different types are there? Number of participants exposed to different trials are there. Based on the number of participants, the, whether the goal is to show whether this drug is superior or equivalence, we can know. And based on the investigator and the participants, whether the intervention is no, the single blinded or double blinded. So based on the different aspects of intervention, whether it's the efficacy trial or the effectiveness trial, efficacy trial means does the intervention work? in the people who actually receive it. These trials are very explanatory, confirm the physiological or the clinical hypothesis. The effectiveness means how does the intervention work in those who offer. This is called pragmatic trial. Pragmatic trial means in the, inform a clinical or a policy decision by providing evidence of adoption of the intervention the real world clinical practice. Okay, so the efficacy trials, I'll show you what is the difference. In the ideal setting, that means in the research setting, does it work? That's the efficacy, hypothesis, placebo control, double blind. So we should have a hypothesis saying that the drug A works better than type B, drug B, and should just placebo arm, it's a double blind. The, the investigation does not know, the patient does not know. Pragmatic means does it work in the real world? The effectiveness trial. Choices between alternative approaches of healthcare. Suppose, for example, I'll tell you, if you have treated patients with lupus nephritis, there are two drugs are there. Okay, there is one drug called azotypine, one drug called cyclophosphamide or microphenolate. If I do a placebo control trial, the patient should not know that what he is getting. That's a real efficacy. Pragmatic trial means it's an open care, it's saying that, okay, I'm going to give this drug for you. I'm going to give microphenolate for you. I'm going to give azotypine for you. We are going to follow them. It is not like a real randomized control trial, but it's a Standard of care is given and so open label. At the end of five years, we'll know which works better. So here is a example of efficacy trial, a comparative efficacy in incremental dose per respond to methotrexate versus appointment for methotrexate naive patients with psoriasis. So here they're having the psoriasis patients who are not receiving methotrexate. They're going to give two drugs of type of drugs. One is methotrexate, one is aprilimas, two new drugs. And they want to show that aprilimas, aprilimas works better than in psoriasis. In pragmatic trial, a pragmatic multicenter randomized control trial, comparative assessment of chewing gum and brufen in management of orthodontic pain with fixed appliances, a pragmatic multicenter randomized control trial. Based on the hypothesis, what do you want to show? I want to show drug A is superior to drug B, that is called superiority trial. Now, equivalence means both works are the equal. Okay, the response rate for this drug is 30%. Response rate of this drug is 30%. That is called equivalence. Superiority means I want to show the drug B 
works 20% more than the drug gave. Non-inferiority means you will say that both have it is non-inferior to the standard of care. It is not superior, it is not equal, but not very much inferior. Clinical equivalence means the clinical outcomes are reduced both in the same thing. Bioequivalence means the pharmacokinetics parameters such as blood concentrations or receptor occupancy rates are same. So, what do you mean by superiority, equivalence or non-inferiority? Suppose, this is the treatment group, this is the control group, this is the real, there is, here we say there is no difference. Okay, here this is the mean, there is no difference between the treatment and the control group. If I say that the difference what you observe, the margin you keep, you say that the treatment is better, this is no difference, here means the drug does not work, here means the drug works. This is what you have to do. Um, so, if you keep the superior level here, it becomes a superior trial. If you say it's equivalent, so you keep the margin here and non inferiority, don't show the superiority, don't keep it as zero, but you keep it in the middle of equivalence or non inferiority, superiority, then it becomes a non inferiority trial. So, based on this hypothesis, we divide them into superiority trial, equivalence trial, non inferiority trial. So, here I will show you example of equivalence trial. Comparison of oral amoxicillin versus intravenous penicillin for community acute pneumonia in children, a multi center, pragmatic, randomized controlled equivalence trial. What does it mean is either in the, in the pneumonia patients, we can give IV pencil penicillin, but instead of giving intravenous drug, we can give oral amoxicillin and say that both were sequel so that we don't need to admit these patients for IV antibiotics. This trial showed that. Equivalence. Why do you want to do equivalence trial? Because the effective treatment, existing treatment is effective. Placebo controlled trial is unethical. We cannot do a trial without giving IV, penicillin, and placebo because it's unethical to do a placebo controlled trial because we know that in children with pneumonia needs a drug. Okay. And we also know the treatment is not substantially better than the existing treatment. It may be because of great convenience because amoxicillin was. Orally, fewer side effects, lower cost, high quality of life, provide an alternative or second line therapy. This is an example of non inferiority trial. So, this is a trial using two chemotherapy regimens in patients with advanced chronic lymphocytic leukemia, the international open label phase 3 trial, non inferiority trial. And get some water. <clears throat> Based on the participants. How many, number, how many people are the participants exposed to the intervention we call parallel trials, crossover trials and trials with factorial design. So, comparison, this is a parallel design. So, parallel design means it's a common design. We have only two arms, either the treatment arm and a control arm or the experimental drug or there is a placebo. So, we have two groups. One is a treatment group, another one is a control group. Control group may be a placebo or a another drug. Most common clinical design complete randomization design in which patient receives one and only treatment in a randomized fashion. So, either you get treatment or you get placebo. For example, here they are using analgesic efficacy of oral ketrolac versus intramuscular tramadol. So, after the third molar surgery, a parallel group. Parallel means only two arms, parallel arms, randomized placebo controlled clinical trial. So, here they are trying to do either you give oral medicine or you give IM injection for the pain. And you see which one works better. Crossover means so you have a group of people, you randomize them into group A and group B, and uh, you are giving a drug A, drug B. Here is going on. Then after some time, you begin a washout period and you change the drug. So you are giving drug B to this group A and drug A to group B. But remember that sometimes if the washout period is not adequate, the effect of the drug B may be carried over, say, during the drug A time. And say the drug A may be working very well. So, here is a crossover trial a intervention with mineral water disease decreases cardio risk metabolism. Here, they have two types of mineral waters in a moderately hypercholesterolic patients. Initial time, they will get one mineral water. After there is a washout period, they will get the second type of mineral water and see which one works better. So, what is the advantage of crossover trial? The number of patients can be very less in the trial because the same patients will act like a control for the other group and patients for the previous group.
factorial design. So, so far we talked about two drugs or parallel design, drug A, drug B or drug A placebo. Here we have more than two groups, drug A, drug B, drug A plus B one group, neither drug, there is a placebo. So, you can have four arms in a trial, in a randomized control trial, more than two arms, we can have four arms and we have interventions, four interventions are going on. At the end of the trial, we get four different results and we can say which one is better than the other. Sorry, I will take it one. Yeah, <clears throat> so that is called factorial design. That's called factorial design. We have drug A, drug B. So some group is getting both the groups and now last one is the placebo. So here is an example for a factorial design. Here is a 2 is to 2 factorial design. That means there are, are going to have four different groups. Effects of nicotine gum and counseling among the light smokers. So among the light smokers, they are going to give nicotine gum for one group, counseling one group. One group is going to get both. And now the last group is going to get nothing. So that's a placebo. And you find out which group works better. So that's called factorial design. Based on number of patients, can you do a randomized control trial with one patient? Answer is yes. That's called N of 1 trials. We can have fixed size sequential trials. These are the number of different types of based on the number of participants. We can divide the randomized control trial into these types also. So this is a N of 1 trial. So we have only one patient. This is very common in a dermatology. Suppose you give skin, we have a skin lesion. Half of the lesion you apply one drug. Half of the lesion you apply placebo or another drug and see which group is working. Or is a form of crossover trial. Somebody comes with a headache. I have one patient with a headache. One week you give paracetamol. Then don't give any drug. After that you give brufen. Then you ask the patient which one works good for your headache. So this is called one of N of one trial. So even with one patient you can do a randomized controlled trial. So that is called N of one trial. Split person design. This can be done if you have a mouth. So one side of the mouth, the lesion in the mouth, you apply one drug. The other lesion, the other side you apply a drug B or you change over after some time. So it's called split person design. Okay. Again, you have a psoriasis all, all over the body. One side you apply a one drug, the other side you apply the other drug and see which one works better. Again, we can do it in the eyes. Suppose you have conjunctivitis. One eye you apply one drug, you apply another drug in the second eye and see which eye works. So one patient, if you have two organs, two sides, we can do the same trial also. This is enough on trial, silicoxib compact with two, sustained paracetamol for osteoarthritis. So same patients you give silicoxib for some time and you give paracetamol, sustained release paracetamol for other time. Mega trials, there's a huge trials, numbers are huge. Usually it's multi-center, can pick up very small effects. Here you can see a trial, mega trial, where you have 20,000 patients with ischemic stroke were identified. It's a randomized placebo trial of yearly aspirin use in 20,000 patients with acute ischemic stroke. There is another new design in randomized trial called something called withdrawal design. We know that this drug works and is unethical to conduct a placebo control trial if you give placebo to that arm. So this is a overcome by something called withdrawal trial. So here what they do is initially they start everybody will get a drug. Okay, everybody will get a drug that's an experimental drug and you take the people who respond as Okay, you have 10 patients here, 12, 10 people, only 5 of them responded, 5 of them did not respond to this drug. So the 5 of them will escape and they will go to further treatment. The people who responded to the drug, you give them, you randomize them to either one group to continue the treatment, the another group to placebo. So what does it mean? So what do you think? The people who receive the placebo, the disease will come back. Compared to the people who control you, continue the treatment. So this is an indirect way of saying that if you remove the drug, the disease will flare. Okay. Okay. So this is a typical example for a withdrawal study. This is the effect of one drug called toxilisumab in children with arthritis, randomized, double blind, placebo controlled withdrawal phase 3 trial. So here, open label trial. They have 56 children. They, are, they gave everybody will get a drug. At the 8 weeks. At the, eight, at the end of every 2 weeks, they are giving. At the end of 6 weeks, after 3 doses, six weeks, they are assessing. The people who had this response, 
or further randomized. If they don't have the response, they'll go to the, they'll come out of the study. So they randomized into both the groups, placebo group, one group will continue the drug, another group will get the same injection, but it's a placebo. And you see, what will you see? If, what's the assumption? If you give placebo, the placebo group, the disease will come back. So that is called double blind withdrawal trial. You withdraw the drug and see whether they flare. Based on the randomized control trials, based on the level of blinding, it is called open trials, single blind, double blind, triple blind. Okay, so the blinding is very, very important because if the if the primary investigator knows which is a study, which is a drug, which is a placebo, there will be a lot of problems will come. The, the, prim, the primary investigator will put all the patients who are sick to the treatment group, to the patients who are not sick to the placebo group. So there is a blinding comes here. So in the open trials, all the, the all the participants and investigators know who is getting what intervention. So he will know. Suppose you are doing a medical versus surgical treatment. So everybody knows I am getting a tablet, I am going to get a surgery. So if it is a single blinded, means subject is only blinded, investigator knows and the monitoring committee or the sponsor knows. So the investigator is also blinded, become double blind. The outcome assessor or the investigator and the subject, all of them are blind, it becomes triple blind. Can you do a trial? Suppose I want to give Injection, I want to give a tablet. So two groups. Can you do a randomized double blind control trial? Especially this happens in asthma. One, one person may be taking a tablet, one person may be taking an inhaler. So can you do tablets are better than inhalers? Can you do a trial? Yes, we can still do a trial. There is something called double blind, double dummy trial design. What do you mean by that? Every patient will get one tablet and one inhaler. So at the end of the trial, we'll know. So that means one Tablet is a placebo, drug is the inhaler, in the other group, tablet is the original, inhaler is a placebo. So everybody will get both, one tablet and one inhaler. So at the end of the day, we will open the code, code and see which one is a drug, which one is a placebo. That is called double blind, double dummy, trial design. Okay, so the next one, something called allocation concealment. Allocation concealment. What do you mean by allocation, concealment and blinding? Don't confuse these two terms. Allocation, concealment is done before randomization. Before randomization, allocation, this is a selection bias. The primary investigator should not know which patient will get drug, which patient will get placebo. So that is called allocation, concealment. That's, that prevents selection bias. After the randomization, we do blinding. Blinding means whether the investigator is blinding, patient is blinding, or the outcome assess is blinding. So that comes as something called performance bias. How does this new drug perform? For example, I'll tell you, we are going to give, we are going to do, do a new drug to somebody. Okay, drug A and drug B. If the outcome accessor, the, the outcome is assessed by a person, if he knows what is the group A, group B, his Assessing the BP will become difficult and different. If he knows that, okay, this patient has got a drug, the other patient is a placebo, he may think that the BP will be less controlled in the people who developed the, who taken the drug. So that is called blinding. So the out, it decreases the performance bias. Selection bias is decreased by concealment of allocation. How do you minimize bias in a randomized controlled trial? So allocation bias, that is usually the primary investigator. So that can be prevented by doing a randomization. That can be prevented by doing randomization. Performance bias can be, as I already told you, concealment of allocation, performance bias. Blinding can do that. Assessment bias is again blinding. Attrition bias means loss of follow -up can happen in any randomized control trial. You can have loss to follow. -up. There are certain ways, how can we deal with loss to follow up? An allocation concealment, I already told you, it will reduce the selection bias. So now you have started during the trial, you have finished the trial, how are you going to analyze this? During the course of trial, inappropriate, inappropriate handling of the withdrawals, dropouts, protocol violation. You assume that everybody will follow the protocol till the end. They may not follow the protocol. After some time, if they, if, if you think, if the patient thinks 
he is in the placebo group that's why he is not getting better he may say that i don't want to continue the same drug till your 2 years or the till the trial gets years i want to stop i want to go out of the trial so the patient goes out of the trial the trial is supposed to go for 2 years after 1 year the patient feels the drug the treatment is not working so he may go out so they he may drop out so what will you do with those people so when you do the analysis we have two different types of analysis one is called intention to treat analysis another one is called per protocol analysis there are two different types of analysis one is a intention to treat analysis or per protocol intention to treat means all participants are included in the analysis as part of the groups to which they are randomized regardless whether they completed the study or not what do you mean by that suppose i allotted a patient to group a i allotted the next patient to group b so this patient was allotted study participant who is allotted to pay group a till the end whether he goes out or not he has to be included in the same group you cannot change the group that's called intention to treat i'll show you example suppose we have 100 people in treatment a and 100 patients in treat control group so this is a treatment this is a control control may be another treatment or placebo so we are following this 100 patients at the end of the study we have 100 in this arm 100 in this arm if you do include everybody that is called intention to treat analysis suppose out of 100 patients in the treatment arm only 20 people are adherent 80 people sorry 80 are adherent and 20 are not adherent so you do your analysis with this 80 patients so we will have 80 patients in treatment arm and 100 patients in the control arm so if we do analysis with this we will usually overestimate so per protocol comparison overestimate the difference between the treatment and the control group so the ideal treat ideal way of analyzing any randomized control trial is a intention to treat analysis so how do you analyze a data in a randomized control trial in a randomized control trial we have remember we should know that what is called null hypothesis or what is called alternate hypothesis null hypothesis says that this intervention does not work suppose you have drug a and drug b i will say that drug a does not work in managing our outcome of this patients compared to drug b alternate hypothesis says that there is a difference between the drug a and drug b so either you have to reject the null hypothesis or you have to accept the alternate hypothesis there is a whole concept of the randomized control trial so either you have to reject the null hypothesis or you have to accept the alternative hypothesis so what are the outcome measures so the outcome measure you can have fixed points in time okay 6 months what happens or at 1 year what happens you can have fixed outcomes so the proportion of the outcome at each follow up we can do odds ratio we can do prevalence ratio we can do between intervention and control group or events per person the rate of outcomes every 100 years person that we can use or we can use time to the event using a kaplan meier curve okay what happens to each patient during the particular time at the follow up somebody has got a good outcome at 3 months somebody has got a good outcome at 6 months somebody has got a very good outcome at 9 months so there is called survival analysis how do they survive during the study period there is something called prob p values and confidence interval statistical significance something called statistical significance versus something called clinical significance statistical significance means we say either by p values or by confidence interval so in a randomized control trial we report the we report the study findings by a p values or by confidence interval so pre value means p value means probability that observed difference between the two groups might have occurred by chance that means what you are what do you mean by that is a probability so you are finding a difference between these two groups drug a and drug b you are having a difference whatever you want to show is that is there a real difference or the difference what you are seeing occurred by chance by doing a study we are finding you are exactly supposed to find the truth but you cannot find the truth because of various risk factors so we will be able to find sometimes the difference what you really see happens by chance so we assume in the epidemiology world we assume that up to 5% can happen by the chance so if anything less than 5% we are accepting that there is a real difference if there is more than 5% if there is a difference we say that whatever the difference you see 
it happens by the chance and it is not significant when you take the conference interval 95% conference interval is the one which is very much used it is used to estimate the range within which 95% certain that the true population treatment effect will lie. Suppose I assume, suppose I am doing a trial in CMC alone between a drug A and drug B for a hypertension. Then I show that there is a difference of 10 millimeter difference between the, in the systolic blood pressure between the treatment A and the treatment B. Suppose somebody is doing a study in elsewhere, they also should be able to show the same difference. It may not be same 10 millimeter mercury, it may be 8 or 12. But you cannot say that if I do a study and say drug A works, and you cannot say do the same study and say the drug does not work. So we what we assume is the treatment effect of the true population lies between that conference interval. That means the conference interval may be 8 to 12. I told you 10 is the one which I got for the BP difference between two groups. But if you get somebody may get 8, somebody may get 12. So that is called conference interval. Now what you say is 95% of the time, if you do this, repeat the same study, your range of the treatment effect lies between these two values. Then what is called clinical significance? <coughs> the difference in the effect size between the groups that could be considered to be important in the clinical decision making regardless of whether the difference is statistically significant or not. So clinical significance, suppose you say you take same blood pressure example. If you have two groups of drugs, drug A, drug B, I want to say that drug A is superior to drug B. And I will say that the difference I can show between these two groups, two medicines in the group is three millimeters. That means what I see meaning is three millimeter means if I use drug A, your BP between these two groups, three millimeter. If I use drug B, the number of systolic blood pressure will reduce by three millimeter it may come as statistically significant. Is it clinically significant? As a physician, I may not take 3 millimeter difference between the study group and the control group as significant. I will take it significant if there is a difference between these two groups or at least 10, more than 10 millimeters of mercury. So that's called clinical significant. Difference between statistically it is significant because the p-value comes as less than 0.05 but clinically it is not significant. I will tell you one example. This is a study done in our department, which is published in Indian Pediatrics a little long time back. So what they are trying to do is any children who is coming to pediatric casualty with fever and they are going to do one group, they are going to give tepid sponging, the other group they are going to give drug paracetamol plus tepid sponging and see what is the outcome. The sample size was calculated, minimum of 60 in each group, the 90% power of detecting a difference of 0.4 change. What do you mean by that? If somebody comes with 104 fever, if I give paracetamol plus tepid sponging, the fever will come down by 103.6. That's the 0.4 difference they are able to show. Is it clinically significant? Answer is no. They showed in the study, it is statistically significant, but if I say pediatrician, I will say that, okay, this patient comes. If somebody comes and asks me, I will tell them, if we take both this treatment, that is your tepid sponging plus paracetamol, your temperature, will reduce by 0 0.4 percent, 0 0.4 degree Fahrenheit, which is not clinically significant. That's the difference between statistical significance such as clinical significance. Okay, how do you conduct an RCT? Conducting an RCT is really a difficult task because we should write the protocol first. The protocol should have a rational, rational is your hypothesis. Then you should have your aims, your objectives, your research question you have to ask. Then what type of study design we already told is randomized control. Who is your patient? What is the drug? What is the dose? Who is going to do assessment? What will happen if the withdrawal comes? Data analysis, data discharge. So all has to be planned during the protocol phase. Then the ethics, patient consent, adverse effects. All has to be mentioned. What is we're going to do? Everything in advance when you write the protocol writing stage and we also should document each and everything during the protocol writing stage. Then we have to select the participants. Remember that likely to benefit and that to harm. So any research you should not harm that even if you don't do good you should not do any harmful research that is again ethical. If you know that drug works we cannot do a study by giving a placebo to the other person unless you give a 
basic standard of care. So we also should know select the participants basically whether this fellow will come for follow likely to adhere, and this fellow should be a representative of the population. An adequate sample size. We also should get adequate sample size. Will you able to get so many participants with this particular inclusion criteria for your randomized control trial? And measure the baseline variables. Randomize eliminates the baseline confounding. I already told you randomization eliminates because both the people will have confounding factors in the both the groups, which will get nullified ultimately. Then the blinding. Blinding eliminates the measurement of outcome. Bias. Then follow up those patients. Adherence to the protocol. How many people are really adherent to the protocol? How many of them lost the follow up? Then you measure the outcome. Again, outcome has to be an objective one. It cannot be subjective. The positive outcome, negative outcome. Clinically important measures. How they improve the clinically? They see what is the outcome they have kept. Adverse events. What are adverse events happen? Then primary and the secondary outcomes. So, what is the primary outcome? What is your hypothesis? Which which your study design is your study numbers are really designed based on your primary outcome. Okay. So next comes the stopping rules. When you have a trial, randomized control trial, there is sometimes we have to stop the trial in between. Why do you want to stop the trial? Because Two things can happen because the randomized control trial because the randomized control trial as a primary investigator and the patient does not know who is taking which drug or placebo. So what they do is when we plan a study for two years, we'll make something called interim analysis. We'll predefine stopping rules. So we will say that, okay, I'm going to give drug A and drug B. If the adverse effects are going to more than 20%, we have to stop the trial. So we have some predefined stopping rules and you control, study the trial. The trial may be for two years. Okay, we will do interim analysis once in six months. At six months, there is a blinded people. There is some other statisticians should see the results of the trial and say that they have to see two things. One is, is there any bad adverse effects in either group, either in the placebo group or the drug group or the response rate. Is there is a response rate very good in the treatment group? For example, I tell you, we had one recently one study is published in NEGM in children with uveitis. There's uveitis, the inflammation in the eyes. They started to do a trial. Everybody will get methotrexate because methotrexate is a standard of care. And one group they gave placebo, the other group they gave a drug called adalimumab which is a TNF alpha blocker, it's an injection. So placebo injection, drug injection and the baseline and the, uh, they have all of getting the standard of care, which is a methotrexate. So we have to tell the patients they're getting the drug. One patient is the injection, placebo injection, one is a drug. So the drug, their study is going on. After one year, when they did the interim analysis, they found out there is a very good response rate in the treatment arm. Then the ethics said that, see, you, are, you have very good response to the treatment group, but there is very less group of treatment in the control group. You cannot control, you cannot continue the study because it's unethical to continue the study if you know that this drug works very beautifully. Sometimes same thing can happen or reverse. What is the reverse? Suppose the patient getting adalimumab or getting a lot of side effects, then also we have to stop that drug. So this trial was stopped at one year, even though with the less numbers of patients, they are able to show the superiority of adalimumab in children with uveitis compared to the children without UV, without the drug. So this is called stopping rules. So the trial is usually monitored by something called DMC, which is called Data Monitoring Committee or Data Safety and Monitoring Board, DSMB. In CMC Valor, in the Biostatistics Department, we have separate Data Safety and Monitoring Board. If you are doing a randomized control trial in CMC, we have to submit our data to this committee. This committee will see the data and see whether is there anything harm done to the participants of this study. Okay. The next one. Initiatives to improve the quality of reporting of studies. So we have done a randomized control trial now. How I have to report? So there are certain guidelines for 
reporting. For the RCTs, we have something called unsort guidelines. For diagnostic studies, we have something called start guidelines. Strobe is for observation studies. Moose is for reporting a meta-analysis of observation studies. And meta-analysis of RCTs, we have something called Prisma. So there are various ways to report a study. It is not, remember that, it is not to do a study, it is basically to report a controlled RCT. So this is the consort guidelines, what's given there. So what happens is during when you send a study, after finishing your randomized control trial, you are sending a trial to a journal. The, the authors will hide a lot of things. They want, don't want to tell something to the report, to the readers. But if to the, according to the guidelines, if you report, so here is the guidelines, they said that in the title and the abstract should be like this, introduction you have to write this, and in the methodology, participants, intervention, what is the objective, outcome, single blinding, all those things as we mentioned in the consort guidelines. So that should be also something called flow chart. And here you should say how many patients were screened, how many patients were really randomized to two groups, what happened to the allocation, follow up and analysis. So one figure to show all the events which happened in the trial. So that is called flow chart. So any questions? So, so far for the last one hour, we are talking about randomized control trials. Is there any question you want to ask me? I'm very happy to answer the questions. Any questions you can type here, I will try to answer in randomized control trial. Am I audible to you all? Any questions? Do you have to ask me? Thank you, Shivani. Thank you. Can we start with the community trials? Okay. Okay, so community trials. So first we should know what is a community. So I told you randomized control trials happens in a controlled environment. Most of the time it is in the hospital and we also do it in the something called clinical trial unit, which is very, very controlled manner. So we know who is the patient, who is the control and what is happening. Each and everything which happens has to be reported to the, uh, we, have to, we, we have to document whatever is happening. Even they have a viral URI or anything happens during the trial it has to be documented. So community trials are a little different because the trial happens in the community, which we mean is a large number of people. They are doing their routine work. So we may not be able to get all those details. So so what is a community? So community is a group of people living in a defined geographic area who share a common culture or arranged in a social structure and exhibit some awareness of their identity as a group or a group of individuals organized into a unit. So you organize, okay, this is a this village is one unit and manifesting some underlying trait or common interest to the locality of catchment or the area population. So basically they are group of people which they have a common thing to share. So examples of a community-based interventions. Okay, screening or immunization programs delivered to residents of a geographical area. So, for example, a few years back, our Chad, our community health department, government introduced a new program in a Kanyam body block. They started to give hepatitis B, sorry, H influenza vaccination to a particular community or particular place. What happens after that? They want to see the incidence of pneumonia after introduction of this vaccine, the community level. The incidence of pneumonia in this community was very high. They are able to show after introducing the H influenza vaccine, the incidence of pneumonia in children has come down. So that is the immunization program. Screening program. Okay. The screening program, whenever the screening program increases in the community, your chance of identifying the disease will be more. For example, 
you do pap smear for all the women who are more than 40 years and you find out the incidence of cervical cancer is more health promotion programs delivered to schools and towns one example i told you as a cluster randomization they started to give albendazole to group of slums so these are the community level interventions sometimes the rational why do you want to do a community why can't you do only in the people who are coming to the hospital what is the rational environmental change may be easier than the voluntary behavior change like you taxing the instead of saying that you don't smoke you don't smoke you don't smoke you increase the tax of the cigarettes or you increase the tax for the liquor so what happens is when the liquor rate goes high overall the incidence of cigarette smoking comes down so that is the intervention you can see that okay this number of people smoking is so much before increasing the tax so after increasing the tax that this comes down if we show that we can make a policy to the government saying that okay please increase the tax of this items this will decrease the effect in the community because most of the risk factors are socially influenced so there is two models of community interventions two models of community interventions one is a social experiment or a grassroots program social means is outside the community overall community grassroots means particular people particular people i want to do this intervention so that that particular disease comes down and i see that so the primary goal here in the social experiment is generalizable knowledge about the effectiveness here is solution is perceived problem in a target community here we will evaluate somebody is giving a fund i will evaluate in the overall time here the community leaders okay i am a community leader this community has got particular problem i am going to do intervention and see that whether that comes down so here is just one and here is one or more for example for a grassroots that means particular group of people okay nurse midwife program for low income women so somebody has got a low income so you send a nurse to particular group of people and see what's happening and various needle exchange programs for intravenous drug users usually these are not ex true experiments communities are randomly allocated and uh, because it's a community everybody may not take that intervention or a few people will take some people may not take also social experiment i told you this is social experiment means the whole community is in a very famous social intervention trial is something called commit trial this is a community intervention trial for smoking cessation so they have 11 pairs of matched communities 10 communities are from us one community is from canada for this trial so they introduce intervention they introduce different types of intervention in the community for smoking cessation so what they did is one is through media and community wide events they did public education health care providers they went and spoke to them work site and organizations they had some mode of telling that to stop smoking and cessation resources okay you give them nicotine cigarettes you give them ele electronic cigarettes so that they should stop smoking there are multiple interventions done in a matched communities what they found out is you can see this intervention group comparison group there are 5000 people here 5000 people here they divided the smokers into heavy smokers that means they smoke more than 25 cigarettes light light smokers means they smoke less than 25 smokers and that is they did the intervention between the intervention group and the comparison group they found out that you can see this community means the difference is statistically significant because it's less than 0.05 in this different communities by various methods then they say that you these are the methods to prevent or to reduce smoking in the community so this is called commit trial okay there are various community trials vaccine effective studies i told you nutritional supplements micronutrient supplements in children and women in pregnant women you do this intervention in the community level intervention in the maternal and neonatal health family planning treatment of sexually transmitted infections good parent good prenatal control kangaroo mother programs so these are the various community level program which government tries to do in the community to prevent neonatal death or maternity death then education i already told you campaigns against tobacco or in favor of exclusive breastfeeding you do in the community 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 trials will make the government make a policies so that's what very very important vector control and disease transmitters okay vector control program you introduce in one community and say that okay because we introduce this vector control 
number of incidents of malaria and dengue are less so that we can tell the government you have to pay more or you have to spend more for this community to prevent this uh, diseases major measures to prevent injuries such as traffic accidents for example you introduce a police can introduce uh, to the public about the safety of the helmets and they can say that after that intervention lot of the number of people increasing the wearing the helmets have increased so what is the community trials provide community trials provide an important information for making public health decisions and optimizing the national health programs so after this kid b trial was done in the community and showed that incidence of pneumonia is less after introducing of h influenza b vaccination the government started to introduce the flu influenza vaccination to everybody in the community so they this is what happens by doing a community trials okay so the community trials may be different forms it can be a cross sectional survey or follow up of the cohort all all the different types can be done in the community it's not only a randomized control trial it could be a cohort trial okay you have follow your people for example smoking causes lung cancer is my hypothesis i follow a cohort of patients in the community remember if you do a cohort study you are not intervening you are just following them at the end of the five years you see that the incidence of smoking is more than among the people who smoke than people who does not smoke sometimes blinding is not possible in this because we are not intervening anything blinding is not possible in this group of our studies so we can do it at the community level we can do it in the individual levels also we can do tobacco sales to assess smoking prevention intervention so you tell them that we don't sell tobacco in the school area so that does it prevent <coughs> smoking among the school going children again you should hear i have a hypothesis how does this program work you measure the key elements of the model to understand why the intervention is successful or not successful you should assess the outcomes we should do the process formative evaluation has to be done all as a typical typical like a randomized control trial so what are the important considerations when you do a randomized control trial first you have to do your community it has to be randomized as a cluster recognize the clusters a unit of intervention or you allocate the, the treatment justify the clusters a unit of intervention for allocation you have to justify why i am using one group as the cluster as a intervention group another as a comparative group include enough clusters you should have number of patients should be more in each cluster randomize the clusters whenever possible try to do a randomization and allow the clusters when computing the sample size so when you this is also needs a sample size consider the use of matching or stratification of the clusters so that they are uniform when you do the stratified okay this cluster should have all the old women like that we have to do that and consider different approaches to repeat assessments in a prospective evaluations especially when you are doing a cohort study allow for the cluster for analysis and allowing for confounding by individuals and cluster characteristics features and sometimes if you have different clusters different people who are randomizing we may have to we may have to uh, do intra cluster correlation st statistics to do the correlation okay so i'll stop it here if you have any questions i'm very happy to answer uh, here yeah so which epidemiology book do you recommend i think for this whole of your lecture there is something called leon cardis for epidemiology